Good morning. It is good to be with you once again. It is a beautiful spring morning as I am making this recording, and I'm just so pleased to be able to spend a few minutes with you studying God's Word this morning. I want to start by showing you a couple of pictures. We let our children decorate our front windows for Easter this year, and I thought they turned out rather pretty. Here's one of the windows, and um, here's the other. Of course, now that Easter is officially over as a holiday, we've cleaned our windows off. We have clear panes once again, but I find myself missing the color and the creativity as I walk through that hallway by those windows. But it caused me to reflect on the fact that spiritually, Easter is never really over for the Christian. Our lives are always colored by the beauty of the resurrection and by the truth of the resurrection. We walk in that resurrection power every day. And so in that spirit, I'm delighted that we are once again going to study the resurrection this morning in our Bible study. And specifically, we're going to look at why the resurrection matters. Um, in other words, what difference does the resurrection make not only for our eternal salvation, but also in our daily lives? I really like that question. So let's spend a little time looking at that today. I hope you'll grab your Bibles. I've got mine right here with me, and we are going to look once again at that beautiful 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians. So let's jump right in. And here are the verses 20 through 23 of 1 Corinthians 15. Now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, and afterward at his coming, all of those who belong to Christ. I love this idea of Christ being the first fruits. It shows up a couple of times in this passage, and that is just really a great thing. And of course, that means that he is the first to be resurrected, uh, or at least the first to be resurrected not to die again. We're familiar with stories like the story of Lazarus, whom Jesus raised from the dead, but he was raised back to his earthly body, and he experienced death after that. Jesus was the very first to be raised to walk in a glorified, resurrected body, never to die again. He is the first fruits in that sense. Um, what a wonderful thing. But the, the thing I love about first, one thing I love, is it implies there's going to be second. And we are that second. Um, he is the first fruits, but we will someday as Christians be raised in resurrected bodies to live forever with Jesus. And I find that amazing. We serve a powerful God. He is powerful enough not only to resurrect himself from the dead, but also to take us with him as the rest of the harvest, as it were. Um, I think of that beautiful passage in 1 Thessalonians. I'm going to read from 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. The Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And after that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. What a glorious thing. Jesus is the first fruits. He has been resurrected from the dead, but he has the power to bring all of us with him eventually. We are the rest of the harvest that will come after that first fruits. So that is a glorious thought. And I just want to remind you again in terms of the difference it makes in our lives. Uh, my thought there is that we need to live with expectant joy. There is more to come. We have all of eternity to look forward to. And so let's live our lives today because of the resurrection with expectant joy. But there's even more to the first fruits idea than that. I love all of the feasts in the Old Testament. There's, there's, there's several feasts that the Lord established. The first three, according to the calendar year, I believe, were the Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the Feast of the First Fruits. So this, this First Fruits idea actually had a feast named for it. So when we think about first fruits, we also think about that feast of the first fruits. And actually, the Passover, the unleavened bread, and the feast of the first fruits were all um, embodied, in a sense, in that last week of Jesus' life. He was crucified on the Passover. He was buried during what would have been the feast of the unleavened bread. And then he was raised back to life, resurrected, on the feast of the first fruits. 
Now, that to me is fascinating because what that says is that in a sense, God established Resurrection Sunday a couple of thousand years before the resurrection even occurred. In other words, the Jews were celebrating this Feast of the First Fruits not only as a representation of what the feast meant, but looking forward to the resurrection of Jesus, the ultimate first fruits, if you will. And I, I find that encouraging in so many ways. But for one thing, I find it encouraging in the sense that God has had a plan all along from the beginning of the Old Testament to our present day. He has a plan. Things do not catch him by surprise. He is so good and gracious not only to provide us with salvation, but to put pictures and types and prophecies and so many things in the Bible that point to that plan of salvation so that the more we study his word, the more richly we can understand the depth of his love for us, the beauty of his care for us, um, just so many things we get from studying God's word. And that's just embodied in this idea of first fruits. And again, there's so much more there that that um, people who really study the feast could tell us about that. But I just love that connection of Resurrection Sunday to that feast of the first fruits that was celebrated by the Jews even back in um, as early as Leviticus. So that is a wonderful thing. And that makes me think, that um, not only do we need to live with expectant joy, let me get my document camera back on here, but we also need to live with hope and confidence. The Lord loves us. The Lord has a plan. The Lord has the power to enact that plan, and he is always in control. So let's live with hope and confidence. Another beautiful difference that the resurrection makes in our lives. I think of that verse in Jeremiah 29:11. I know the plans I have for you, plans for your welfare, to give you a future and a hope. So live with hope, live with confidence. The Lord is good. He has such a great plan for us. He is never caught by surprise. Um, I also want to look at one more thing in this first passage of Scripture. It talks about this idea that death came through a man. That would be Adam, of course. And the resurrection also comes through a man. We die in Adam, and then we live in Christ. This is, a, this is an idea that is familiar to us. Um, the New Testament makes it clear, the comparison of Adam being the first man and Christ being the, the second Adam, the one who does it right, essentially, who lives his earthly life without sin. And what a glorious thing. But here's the thing. If we were just in Adam our situation would be dire. It would be a terrible thing because we would still be living in our sin with no way out. But because of Christ and because of his resurrection and his power over the death that sin brings, we can live. Um, we, can, we can live. And so what gratitude we should have for that. It's only in Christ that we find eternal life. So again, that makes me think of one more thing that we want to... Uh, do and that is to live with gratitude so let's live with expectant joy because of the resurrection the the lord has the power to take all of us with him so we will be in heaven one day as believers let's live with hope and confidence knowing that god has a plan for us and the power to enact that plan and let's live with gratitude that christ himself lived that perfect sinless life so that we through him can overcome our sinful natures that we inherited from Adam, and we, through Christ, can live eternally. So let's live with gratitude. That's another difference that the resurrection makes today in our daily lives. Okay, let's move on to the next passage of Scripture. I'm having a little trouble keeping up with my document cam today. Sorry about that. But here are the next few verses, verses 24 through 28. Then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, when he abolishes all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign until he puts all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be abolished is death, for God has put everything under his feet. But when it says everything is put under him, it is obvious that he who puts everything under him is the exception. And when everything is subject to Christ, then the Son himself will also be subject to the one who subjected everything to him, so that God may be all in all. Well, that's a lot, isn't it? That's really a lot, but it's really a beautiful verse. And the idea here is that Paul is essentially saying that God the Son will conquer every enemy, ultimately including death, 
and then he'll hand over all that he's conquered to God the Father. So it's really a picture of a couple of members of the Trinity um, interacting together. Uh, now, I'll just be honest with you. The Trinity is such a mystery to me. I, I simply don't understand it. I don't understand it. But the beauty of that is I don't have to understand it to believe in it. And I do so believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. It is a beautiful doctrine. And one thing it makes me think of in relation to this verse, where it talks about God the Son essentially um, conquering everything, including death, and then handing that over to God the Father, one thing it makes me think of is that with different members of the Trinity, God is able to perfectly model everything for us because he is in relationship with himself, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And through that relationship, he can even teach us about relationships. So here, for example, we see um, we see illustrated for us in these God the Father and God the Son, we see illustrated both perfect submission through the Son and also perfect authority through the Father. So in some mysterious way that I cannot understand or explain, the Trinity just teaches us so much, so very much about relationship through the fact that God is three in one. Um, he exists eternally as one God, one God, but in three persons so that we can see how, how those perfect relationships unfold. Okay, let's go to the final verses of this chapter. I hate to skip so many beautiful verses, but we'll follow the lesson in, an ins in this instance and move on. Oh, I forgot one thing I wanted to say. I'm sorry. Um, speaking of the Trinity, again, I don't understand it, but I'm just in awe of it. I'm in awe of it. And I'm also humbled by all that I don't understand. So I want to live my life in both wonder and humility. Wonder at the glorious awesomeness of God and humility at my place in the world. I want to be the one that learns. I want to be the one that turns to the Lord for answers and that does not live in prideful self-centeredness thinking that I have everything figured out. I still have so much to learn. So with that, let's skip over to the final few verses of the chapter. So these beautiful poetic verses really in verses 54 through 58 when this corruptible is clothed with incorruptibility and this mortal is clothed with immortality, then the saying that is written will take place. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? Now the sting of sin is death, or the sting of death is sin, rather, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the Lord's work, knowing that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Well, this is really quite wonderful. Um, what do incorruptibility and immortality even feel like? I, I can't even imagine what those things feel like in this very corruptible, very corruptible, very mortal body. I, I can't even imagine immortality and incorruptibility, but we're promised that we'll be raised to that. What a wonderful thing. Well, we promise that death will have no sting. Um, it will have no power over us. And again, we can, we can live our lives knowing that. We can live that even though these earthly bodies will die, that's not the end for the believer. We get our glorified bodies, incorruptible, immortal, to live with the Lord forever. And so that makes me want to live my life in victory. And that is my final thing here. Um, let's live with victory, knowing that the Lord has conquered everything. Um, I particularly love that, that quote, death where's your victory, death where's your sting. That quotes the Old Testament prophet Hosea, and it's, it's just a beautiful thing. So live in victory. Now, the other thing we see in these last few verses is that we're actually given our applications for the week. Um, if you've been watching my lessons, you know I love applications. I want to see what the scripture says that I should be trying to do this very week. And right here in, in these verses, these last few verses of 1 Corinthians 15, we see these admonitions from the Lord. Be steadfast. Hold firmly to your convictions. Uh, be immovable. Don't be tempted to doubt or worry, but know that everything is in its place and the Lord is able to take care of everything. Be immovable in your faith. Um, always excel in the Lord's work. 
Work for the Lord with enthusiasm and excellence, um, never giving up. He is so good to us. I think of that verse in Thessalonians, don't be weary in well-doing. Um, I think of the, the Great Commission in Matthew 28. The Lord is with us always, even to the end of the earth. Don't give up. He is with us. Um, I think of that glorious promise in Isaiah that his word, when it goes out, will not return to us void. There are so many promises in the Bible that encourage us to um, be steadfast, be immovable, and hold fast um, to the Lord's work and always continue in the Lord's work, not growing weary. So those are great things to do. Um, and I think those help, the resurrection day helps us do those things. We can live uh, in the resurrection with the ability to be steadfast and movable and to excel in the Lord's work. And then I also just want to remind you some things that I get out of this passage, ways that we should live because of the resurrection. So let's live our lives this week and, and throughout our lives with expectant joy. Oh, we have so much to look forward to. Let's live with hope and confidence. Our God is a great God, a powerful God. He can raise the dead. Oh, that gives us hope. Let's live with gratitude. Just because he can raise us from the dead doesn't mean he has to love us enough to do so. But oh, he loves us so much. Such great love he has for us. So let's live with gratitude for that love. Um, and let's live with wonder and humility. Again, he is a great God, a God beyond our comprehension a God that we need to go to every day um, in prayer and Bible study to learn from and to be taught by the Holy Spirit. And finally, let's live with victory. Oh my goodness, we have the victory over death. And uh, for those reasons, the resurrection means so very much to us. We can live with purpose, knowing that God has a plan for our lives and he wants to work through us to bless the world. So that's all I have for today. I do want to mention that for the next couple of weeks, my good friend and yours, Beth Madison, has volunteered to teach these lessons, and I really look forward to hearing from you, for, from her, rather. I know that you will look forward to that as well. And so, um, but I want you to know that I will miss videotaping these, these Bible lessons. It has been a way for me to feel somewhat connected to you. I do miss my class. I look so forward to being with you again in person, but until then, we'll continue to enjoy videos um, with Beth as guest lecturer for the next couple of weeks, and then I'll be back either via video or in person. Until then, God bless you. Live in victory. Live in expectant joy, knowing that we serve a risen Savior. God bless you always.